Okay, uh, welcome uh, everyone and uh, uh, welcome Robert uh, to you. Thanks for your time. Um, as I mentioned in a little pre-recording, um, uh, the goal here is to help inform our clients uh, who are about to or, or have just finished up the divorce, what they need to do in terms of your realm of expertise, which of course is dealing with trust and estate, and, and Wills. Uh, so before we start, maybe just uh, uh, convey to us for a minute just what's your, your background and your experience uh, with this field. Okay, well, thank you, Adam, for uh, allowing me to participate. I appreciate it. Um, I have been focused on, on estate planning for a little over 20 years. Um, I, I started off in a boutique estate planning firm um, dealing with really a range of, of, of diverse clientele and, and um, objectives. It's mostly, it's, all, it's pretty much all individual planning, um, whether it's tax, asset protection, uh, basic family planning, make sure everyone has the right documents in place. I've had my own practice for a little over 15 years now, again, dealing with um, young people starting off in life, uh, all the way till, till, you know, elder law planning to a certain extent. <clears throat> But uh, the sole focus of my of my my practice is estate planning and administration. Okay, okay, great. So with that in mind, uh, so a couple, uh, an individual or a couple, they uh, just uh, finishing off their divorce. Uh, do they need a new will? So the answer is absolutely, and it probably they probably should address it before the divorce is even finalized. Um, there are a host of of issues that that are raised in the will. Uh, from guardianship to how assets pass, uh, who benefit, how beneficiaries are, are listed, you know, outside of the will, and if if they don't have a new will, their goals are likely not to be kept. Um, <clears throat> so, th there are certain statutes um, that lay out what happens in case of a divorce, and it's really state sensitive, state specific. Uh, I, I think is it fair to focus on New York, New Jersey for this conversation? Or yep. Okay, so you know, New York, New Jersey, both have statutes that that kind of delineate what happens if someone doesn't change their will. And in general, a spouse is removed and is considered predeceased in those scenarios. But what happens? What's the backup? Did you list a backup beneficiary? Um, are trusts created for kids? So those are really important issues that need to be addressed with a new will. Now those statutes don't take effect until the settlement agreement is finalized. So if there was a client that did pass away during the process of the divorce, then that statute wouldn't take effect. So it's really important to, to address it beforehand even. So that statute would take into effect, even if a couple has a separation agreement, they're not yet ready for divorce, maybe for health insurance reasons, as an example, then still uh, it still kicks in. The statute would not kick in yet until, until, the, until the, the separation agreement is finalized. Right, okay. Correct. Um, so, so you're saying that is it advisable to to get the the will, or is it uh, is it necessary? So, a lot of it depends on what the current will says. Um, if it's very thorough and lays out kind of a backup plan, uh, you know that that the client is comfortable with, then it might but might not be technically necessary, but it's strongly advisable. Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, and there are differences in, in state law. For example, um, in in New Jersey, in case of a divorce, not only is the divorced spouse removed from the will, but their relatives are as well. Whereas in New, where in New York, that's not the case. So if I might have listed my spouse's sibling in some sort of fiduciary position, they might still be listed there if I don't update my will. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really it's strongly advisable. You know, also, if you don't have trust, let's, you know, for minor children, then even if, if you, the, the, um, the spouse is removed as a beneficiary and fiduciary, they might end up as the custodian and, and you know, the tip, and, and watching over the money, which might not be what you want in case of a divorce. Okay. So besides a will, a uh, trust, are, are there other legal documents that also should be renewed um, once a divorce or separation agreement happens? Sure. The, the, the two most vital documents other than the will are the durable power of attorney and a healthcare proxy advance directive, um, enabling someone to make financial and or medical decisions on, on your behalf. 
Um, so again, even though those statutes apply to those documents as well, as far as removing the divorced spouse from those fiduciary positions, um, you know, again, if you don't have a backup listed or during the divorce process itself, you want to make sure that someone else can step in and, and handle those, you know, really important decisions in your behalf. So, mm -hmm. you know, the, the will, the power of attorney, advanced directive, uh, if there are other trusts created, those should be looked at as well. But those are the, the, the key documents to take a look at. Mm -hmm. and, and to what extent, as a trusted state's attorney um, helping uh, create these new documents, to what extent do you look at the divorce documents or the separation agreement to prepare you for, for your drafting? Yeah, it's very important. Um, I've had several cases where clients don't provide me with the, the separation agreement, and it's it's very typical that there are requirements laid out in the separation agreement that might become inconsistent with the will, um, whether it be um, insurance or, or certain rights to live in a home or, or whatever, or you know, just um, guardianship purposes. And it's really important to incorporate the requirements that are agreed upon in the separation agreement into the estate plan. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's it, a collaborative approach is, is important to work together with the, the family law matrimonial attorney and the estate planner. And, and let, Robert, let's say if those documents conflict, uh, the divorce settlement agreement and the trust and states documents, how does that play out? So the, the divorce documents would control because that's a contract between the two of them, um, whereas a will can be adjusted whenever whenever an individual wants. Um, but they have no if, if they agreed, you know, if there was a court settlement agreement, uh, divorce agreement, then they really have no right to, to go against that. So the, the, the problem is, you know, the, the if one passes away and the will is submitted to court, then the surrogate court doesn't necessarily have the separation agreement, and it could just lead to complications, litigation, expenses, um, and really, you know, take away from the beneficiaries ultimately. Mm -hmm. Okay. So shifting gears a bit, um, usually in this settlement agreement, the divorce settlement agreement, there's a provision for life insurance in order to protect uh, the payments that one party is paying the other for child support or spousal support. To what extent should that life insurance a uh, policy or the or the the benefit once paid be put in a trust or as to the beneficiary it could just be um, spelled out in the in a form that the life insurance company provides. Yeah, it's a very good question, a very important question. There are it's a, the answer is a little complex because there are many different types of trusts done for many different reasons. Uh, there are testamentary trusts, which are created through a will, and then there are inter vivos trusts, which are created during life, gener generally for tax or asset protection planning. Um, you know, having a life insurance requirement is, is pretty typical in, in a divorce. Um, so th let me just take a step back and, and kind of discuss beneficiary designations in general, because it's something that, that is also vital. Um, that Those statutes that we mentioned before also would change around benefit would, would take away the divorced spouse as a beneficiary on most vehicles uh there where you typically have beneficiary designations are life insurance and retirement accounts uh there are sometimes what's called uh tod transferable on death on non-qualified you know regular bank accounts as well uh again as a part of those statutes the the divorce divorce spouse is removed um, however, when you have a life insurance requirement, sometimes that becomes problematic because by default, the spouse is removed and now all of a sudden no one, they, didn't, they, 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 they have this requirement to pay off the life insurance to the spouse and they're technically not, not, not listed anymore. So it's really important to revisit the beneficiary designations um, on life insurance. Even if you're maintaining the spouse, you have to kind of reaffirm that, that, that the divorce spouse should be listed as the as the um, as the beneficiary. Now, that being said, to go back to your question, as far as as a trust versus non-trust, um, you know, if you're naming children as beneficiaries on life insurance, then it's really important that it's in some sort of trust. If there's a minor child, then the, the it becomes a lot more complicated if you don't have the assets passing into a trust, the life insurance proceeds, um, as well as you might lead to where you have your divorce, your ex-spouse as the custodian over that money, which might not be in, in your, in your, your, you know, might not fulfill your goals. Um, so again, 
it's a little bit of a, of a complex answer because it, it really is very case specific. Um, but I think it's a conversation that you must have with your estate planner when you're when you you know when you're redoing your will. Also, they have to go through all of the the accounts that have beneficiaries and make sure that they're titled properly. Um, but but I think trust planning is really important with life insurance specifically. It also can accomplish. Um, tax tax objectives if you own insurance outright it can be taxable in your estate where if it's within a trust then potentially it can all pass tax free ultimately to to the next generation mm -hmm. can a trust be created by merely filling out some form on uh with the life insurance company Typically, no. Um, there, there are, again, two types of trust, testamentary versus inter vivos trust. If I have a, a will that already has a trust in the will, then you can name that trust as a beneficiary on the life insurance um, beneficiary designations. Um, but absent, absent the, the trust that's already created in the will or an actual trust created during life, just listing a trust as the beneficiary uh, won't accomplish the goals. Okay. And moving from divorce to potentially remarrying, how important is a prenup for estate planning for a divorced person who's looking to get remarried? Yeah, vital, vital. Um, you know, I, I think almost universally a second marriage and, and to a large extent, even a first marriage, but especially a second marriage, there should be a prenup in place. Um, there are a host of issues that come up with second marriage, especially if there are ch children from a prior marriage. As far as asset division, um, there is, you know, almost every state has something called a right of election where a spouse has the right to a certain percentage of the estate, typically a third of the estate, um, even if they're left out of a will. And um, a lot of times, if you, if you have a prenup, then that, that, you know, takes away that requirement. So, uh, this way you're free to, to decide instead of the law deciding for you and um, you know especially issues like uh, a home if there are minor children uh, and a second spouse who gets to, to stay in the home how, how expenses are are, are are paid from that um, you know so it's really really important to to address and 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 have a prenup if you're if you're looking for into a second marriage okay okay that makes sense um so do you um do you have any other advice um just as a kind of catch-all question for a couple who are going through divorce or or just recently divorced uh, from your perspective anything else you want to add before we help you finish up yeah i think you know there are some short-term um items that need to be taken care of and then some longer terms longer term items but uh in general sometimes as i'm sure you you know better than anyone divorces are not uh, always um, smooth or, or acrimonious, so so you know, and and there'll even be, you know, some nefarious action by one one spouse. What I've seen typically, it's very common in marriages that one spouse has a much better grip on finances than the other spouse, whether it's one who's paying the bills versus the other one, or um, not knowing passwords, not even knowing recognizing what where and where all the bank accounts are. I think if you're considering divorce um, or, or start of the process, the first thing to do is really get acclimated and understand what the assets are so that um, assets can't be moved or shifted without your knowledge. That, that's number one. Um, I just had a case where there was one spouse who accumulated a very significant um, uh, gambling debt unbeknownst to the other spouse to the extent where they were pulling money out of out of 401ks you know borrowing from the 401ks and and um and it was you know well into six figures of debt uh if the spouse knew, had known about it and even just looking at, at statements every month and kind of you know get, getting again making sure they're informed they could have tried to put a freeze on certain accounts um, so I think that that's kind of the first step. Number two is um, what we discussed earlier, making sure you address the documents and make sure that you're in a place that if there was, you know, if, if someone passed away during the divorce process, that your assets would pass in accordance with your wishes and not, uh, not by how your old documents were drafted. Um, and then I think number three uh, is, is making sure all the beneficiary designations are, are redone, not relying on state statute. Um, because there are certain exceptions. I think if there was, for example, a, um, 
a, an employer, an employer based policy, let's say a life insurance or other other you know, employee policy that that generally is governed by ERISA. So that would override state law. So if you kept your spouse as a beneficiary, then they might still still be the, entitled to, to the proceeds. Um, th those are the, the kind of things that need to be done relatively short term. I, I think what you know, advice I generally give to not just a divorcing couple, but anyone going through some kind of major life life cycle change um, is also don't act rash. I think you you know people I, I you tend to see people selling things selling selling assets moving um, you know just making big big changes right away I think when you're going through a lot emotionally you have to kind of center yourself uh, talk to people and 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 you know make sure you get proper advice from from a legal tax and personal perspective before anything uh, anything major is done. Sounds true. Sounds wise. Uh, thanks for uh, uh, sharing that Robert uh, so um, I'm uh, done with my questions I'm sure you know once you dive in there are a lot of other questions but that really gives a good general synopsis that I think will be helpful for uh, my clients or past clients so thank you uh, before we finish if you could just share if anyone has any specific questions or might want to use your services how would they find you sure uh, best ways to email me um, I'll give you my email it's Robert at Teichman LLC.com it's t e i c h m a n l l c dot com. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions or or uh, expand on on anything we've discussed today. Okay, great. All right, Robert, thank you so much.